believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish His purposes on earth. I believe all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their Savior. I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to people in need. I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God. I believe there is a heaven and a hell, and that Jesus will return to judge all people and to establish his eternal kingdom. <laughs> Hello, church. It is so great to see you, those of you in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary, our Speedway campus, and we always love for the people that join us online. I want to do a little shout out to one of the people that are watching right now. Her name is Susan L., from uh, Alta Monte Springs, Florida. Let's give it up for Susan L. So glad that you could join us, Susan, and all the rest of you from around the world joining us here at Westside Family Church today. Okay, first order of business is I'm gonna need you to hold up your Believe book or Bible if you brought it. I wanna make sure you have it. I'm gonna give you time to reach down and get it because I know you brought it because I've asked you to bring it. There you go, okay, most of you. If you're, not, uh, if you're new to Westside, you don't know what this is, ask your neighbor, and they'll tell you a little bit about the journey that we, we are on. So there's this new uh, preacher that moved into town, and he began to brag that the amount of time it took him to prepare a sermon was the same amount of time it took him to walk to the church from the parsonage next door. Six months later, the board purchased a new parsonage five miles away. You'll be pleased to know that I live 3.8 miles from the church, and so I have had plenty of time in my walk over here this morning to give you a meal worth showing up for. You ready for that? It's pretty good stuff. Now, um, it's also important for you to know that actually the report card for me, uh, and really for the other pastors of this church, is not in whether or not you like my sermon, because there are times when I need to step on your toes and just get you just downright angry at me uh, for your sake. The, the, the report card for me and for the other pastors of this church is whether or not what we are doing is transforming your life to become more like Jesus. I mean, here's literally what we're after, that a year from today, when you show up in this place, you are fundamentally not going to be the same person you were a year earlier. And that is for the good. And one of the things that we are passionate about is making sure that you can declare uh, what you believe and why it matters. That's an important part of your journey. So we're inviting the folks to call Westside home to finally, finally, after all these years of sitting in church, to have something to show for it. And that is to be able, when someone asks you why you have so much hope in you, that you can now articulate what you believe and why it matters. And so we've been asking you to take a journey with us and I'm gonna kind of rehearse where we're up to at this point, make me proud. If someone asked you the question, who is God? What would you say? Well, here's what I would say. I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What if that person then says, but does this God care about me? What would you say? I would say, I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. Where would you support that in scripture? Well, I would quote Psalm 121, one and two. If you know it, say it with me. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And then what if the person had the audacity to ask, can I have a relationship with this God? How does that work? What would you say? I would say, come on, I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, now to say something that audacious, you better have scripture to back it up. Here's one of my favorites, Ephesians chapter 2 verses eight and nine. You ready? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's pretty good. Now, if the person then were to ask, but how do I know this God better? And how do I know his will for my life? What would you say? 
I would say, I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God that guides my beliefs and actions. And I would quote 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You ready? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then last week we covered this all-important question, who am I? Who am I? Uh, Ready? I am significant because of my position as a child of God. John chapter one, verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Now, church, I do not like to play favorites, but I'll just tell you, you just kicked the stuffing out of the 930 service. You did, you really, really did, you really did, you did. I don't mean to like create any competition within the church, but I just did. Okay, so um, keep making me proud. I wanna ask all of you to raise your right arm as high as you can. All as high as you can, all your right arm. Okay, now I want you to raise it just a little higher. Isn't that funny, isn't that funny? You know, my first assignment was to raise it as high as you can. And then when I asked you to raise it a little higher, each one of you had just a little bit more, right? And that's what I'm gonna ask you to do uh, in this journey. We have five more to go, and I'm gonna ask you to continue the journey. We're asking the children and the students to memorize all 30. We know that you don't have the brain power for that. But, I mean, right, we're getting older, right? But we're asking you to memorize the first 10 core beliefs, key beliefs, so that you can articulate them. So today we come uh, to door number six. And to unlock the key to door number six, you have to ask and answer this question. How will God accomplish his plan? How will God accomplish his plan? What you're gonna see is that God has a master plan and the Bible clearly tells us how God is going to accomplish it. And listen to this, it involves you. It involves you. So let's pray. If you're interested in the answer to this question and how you're involved, you interested? Let's pray and then we'll get to work. Father, we thank you that we're gonna open up your word today and discover some rich truths about you about ourselves, and about how you're going to accomplish this master plan that you have. And we know that it's going to involve us. And so right now, we choose to open up our hands before you and our heart to say, show us, Lord, what you have for us. And based upon your mercy and bringing us eternal life, we will walk in it for the sake of your glory and for your kingdom. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. I wanna begin by telling uh, you that the message you're gonna hear today is a little bit thicker than uh, messages that you might hear on a weekly basis. And even those of you who are mature in your understanding of the word, you might be introduced to some things you have never seen before, okay? So what I'd like to do is start with a very disruptive idea, maybe an idea that you have never thought of before, and here it is. You were not created in the image of God. You were not created in the image of God. I want you to recall with me Genesis chapter one and two when God created the heavens and the earth. After each day of creation, uh, God wrote in the Trinity construction log a summary. It is good. It is good. (laughs) Magnificent, right? And then you'll notice on the sixth day when he created Adam in the garden and stood back and looked at Adam, it's the only time in the six days of creation God literally said, it is is not good. Why? It says in the scriptures, it is not good for the man to be alone. That's the problem. So in Genesis chapter one, verses 26 and 27, God is going to offer a solution to this problem. I need you to pay very careful attention here, ready? Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, isn't it surprising if you look a little deeper in scriptures, aren't you surprised that it says us and it says our and it says our. We just studied in week one that we serve and worship the one true God. 
So what's this concept of us and our? It is referring to the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I'm gonna put up a, a little drawing for you here, and I wanna talk about this side first. We see that God, the God that we serve, is made up of three individual persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they share a being. They're encased in a being. So throughout theological history, we believe that God is three persons in one being. So we only worship one God, one being, but inside of it, there are three individual persons. So God looks at Adam, created in the garden alone, and says, this is not good. So what does God decide to do? God decides to fix this problem. At the moment that Adam, as an individual, is made, he is not made in the image of God. So as we look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, this is what the scripture said was the solution. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And as the man was sleeping, he took out the man's brains and made the woman. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's my wife's translation. I'm sorry, that's the, the woman's authorized version. The women are like, finally, this makes, the Bible's making all kinds of sense to me. I'm sorry. It does not say that. Scratch that from your memory. It says he took out one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man, Adam, said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. It's interesting, God doesn't actually, to create community for Adam, he does not create another human being from scratch by taking another clob of dirt and forming it into a woman, but rather the text clearly says to us, to create woman, he takes her out of the man and makes her, okay? So she is not a separate human being, if you will, but rather she is another person coming out of Adam, the first human being. God, this is what God does. And so there are not uh, two beings, but two persons. So what I'm gonna do is put up a, a second illustration for you to see what God did to create us in his image. God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons who share a being to fix the problem of Adam being alone in the garden, created us in his image, their image, by creating Adam and Eve, two persons, but one being, because Eve is not a separate being, but rather she came out of Adam, two persons, one being, and when God brings Eve to Adam and puts them side by side and steps back, he not only says it's good, but he says it's very, very good. So here's point number two. Write this down. Point number two is we were made in the image of God. We were made in the image of God. This is very important. Dig deep to understand this. Um, the image of God is reflected in the we, not in the me. Now, as we turn the pages in Genesis chapter, to Genesis chapter three, we notice something almost immediately happens. Look at point number three. There it is. We stopped reflecting the image of God at the fall. We stopped reflecting the image of God at the fall. When Adam and Eve reject God's vision and take of the fruit they were invited not to take, we discover that immediately after this, they stopped treating each other the way God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit treat each other. They treated each other differently. As a matter of fact, in the story, when God confronts Adam for what he has just done in taking of the forbidden fruit, do you know the thing that he does? He throws Eve under the bus. He throws Eve under the bus and blames her for the whole situation. Before you giggle too much, women, what does Eve do? Eve turns around and throws the serpent under the bus. And here we begin one of the many weapons in our arsenal 
to hurt each other, we created the blame game. And humanity has been doing that to each other as just one of the many things we do to mistreat each other. But one thing we know for sure, the way in which we treat each other does not reflect the way the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit treat each other. And not only does this happen to Adam and Eve, but we learn as we turn the page to Genesis chapter 4 that the sin nature that is in Adam and Eve, their nature changed that day. It is automatically transmitted to their offspring. We see this in the very next chapter when Cain kills his brother Abel out of a simple act of jealousy. Instead of celebrating his brother for offering a better sacrifice to God, instead of leaning in and learning from his brother, he now has this jealousy. He mistreats his brother in the most severe way by killing him. Thus reflecting that this new nature has now been transmitted to all of his offspring, including you and I. Now, something you've likely never seen is in the next chapter of Scripture, uh, Genesis chapter 5. The following chapter, there is a shift in language in the Bible regarding our identity. Let me put it up and see if you see it. This is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God when he created them. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them mankind when they were created. Next verse. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son, say it with me, church, in his own likeness, say it with me, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Because of sin, Adam and Eve were no longer reflecting the image of God. Their offspring is now made not in God's image, But their offspring is now made in Adam's image, reflecting the nature of Adam, not God. Very important. Now, fast forward to the New Testament. We don't hear much or anything really about the concept of the image of God until we turn the pages of the New Testament and are introduced to a guy named Jesus. Jesus enters into our world wrapped in flesh and moves into our neighborhood. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 19, say this about the arrival and the reflection of Jesus. This is what it says. Jesus reflects the image of God. Jesus reflects the image of God. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Ready? The Son, say it with me, church, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Jesus is God. He is not from the offspring of Adam. The seed that created Jesus is the seed of the Holy Spirit, not the seed of man. And Jesus, we are shown, is reflecting to us from the moment he stepped on our planet. He is beautifully reflecting the image of God, beautifully reflecting how God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit treat each other. Now listen carefully. Lean in. As Jesus finishes his time on earth with us and is crucified resurrected on the third day, he ascends back to the Father. But before he ascends back to the Father, he tells us that he is, has in his plan to create a brand new community to continue the work. And the name of this community we call the, we call the church. Now the church is from the Latin or it's also from the Greek and it essentially means a group of people who assemble together. And we certainly do a good job of that. But the Apostle Paul has a pattern in his writings where he refers to us not so much as just the church, but he calls us, does anybody have an idea? The body of Christ. He calls us the body of Christ. What does this mean? I need you to stay with me here. The New Testament teaches that whenever you decided that day to cross the line of faith, 
Whenever you decided to go all in for Jesus, whenever you decided to receive the forgiveness of your sin offense against God, when you decided on that day to be baptized, and I'm not talking about infant baptism that was from the will of somebody else's vision for your life, but when you made your own personal decision to be baptized, the Bible says that you are baptized into Christ. You were baptized into Christ or you become a member of the body of Christ. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Take a look at this. Now you are, say it with me, church, the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Here's a picture I want to show you now, a new picture. Okay, here we have a picture of God as a community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Three distinct persons who are fully God, who share a being. And now we have here a picture of the church. Each person, at the moment they trust Christ, they are baptized or placed into the body of Christ. This is a collection of persons who share a being called the body of of Christ. This was the vision that God had for Adam and Eve, that they would populate the earth and that they would continue to maintain the vision of God, thus reflecting the image of God. And Cain and Abel and Seth were uh, designed by God to be a part of this, but they fell. And so what is actually happening here? I want you to write down uh, this uh, uh, next point. The restoration of the image of God is found in the body of Christ. The restoration of the image of God is found in the body of Christ. I want you to listen to Romans chapter eight, verse 29. Oh, lean into this one, church. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, say this with me, to be conformed to the image of his son. The destination that God had in mind for you, even before you were born, your predestiny was one, to receive the forgiveness of sins that gives you a right relationship with God. When that happens, number two, to be uh, made a member of the body of Christ, a person who is sharing the body of Christ. And number three, his mission for you is through the help of the Holy Spirit day by day for you to grow spiritually, to become, to look more like Jesus Christ individually and collectively. And that's what spiritual growth is all about. It's not for your own sake, just like a member of, of our body. Our health of every member of our body, it's not just for the sake of that member, but it's for the sake of the whole body so that the whole body can be healthy to accomplish the mission that this body has in the world today. Maybe you heard the story of the students that went on a field trip to visit a famous sculptor. And as they were visiting this famous sculptor, they came upon one of his sculptures of a lion. And one of the children asked the famous sculptor, how did you make this look so real, so much like a lion? And the famous sculptor replied, it's simple. I merely chipped away everything that didn't look like a lion. And this is the work of spiritual formation. God, the sculptor, with our invitation, day in and day out, is seeking to merely chip away everything in our lives that don't look like Jesus so that we can reflect the image of God. Now, I want you to take your Believe book and turn to page 108, a couple sentences down. Or if you have a Bible, you can look in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Uh, the Apostle Paul is referring to us as the body of Christ again, and I want to unpack some things that might make more sense to you than they did in previous times when you visited this passage. Uh, it begins with the phrase, so Christ himself. Okay, start there. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that, the, say it with me, the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith 
and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So my job and the job of the other pastors of this church is to be a gift to you, to come alongside of you and uh, prepare you, to train you, to equip you like personal trainers, if you will, uh, for the life that God has called you to, not just individually, but corporately as one whole expression of the body of Christ. That is what our assignment is. Now, one of the particular assignments that we have been given is to achieve what takes place next in the passage. Then, when I do my job and you're willing to receive it, this is what's going to happen. Then, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of the people in their deceitful schemings. One of the outcomes is that Uh, in my work with you is that you will be able to know with certainty what you believe and why it matters. Now, do you know why in my very first year here, foundational to our journey together is I have to equip you to make sure you know without a doubt what you believe, why it matters, and you can, by golly, articulate it finally with your lips. Right? This is my job. Because I'll tell you why. Because when you leave this building today, you're going to run into some really whacked out people. (laughs) Even in Kansas. I mean, the, the the way that people are thinking today, is anybody with me? I don't even understand how they're coming to this line of thinking. But if you don't know what you believe or why, then whenever they introduce this winsome ideas to you, you're going to be like a little John boat in an ocean. When the waves come, you're going to be tossed here. You're going to be tossed there. You're going to be taking in water. You're going to be drowning. My job is to give you an anchor that goes down to the depths of the ocean so when the waves come in your life and these awful, crazy teachings that will be destructive in your life come, you are solid as the storm reaches over you. Anybody interested in that? By golly, that is good stuff. If I get any more worked up, I'm going to need a handkerchief up here. I can go Pentecostal if you'd like. It's not a pretty sight. Now, the next passage here uh, is our memory verse. Listen to this. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him Who is the head? That is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Like a body, like a body, uh, every part must be healthy and every part has a contribution to make to the overall mission of the body, which leads us to the challenge for us today. Write this down. Our challenge then, individually, as a part of the body of Christ, and corporately, as the body of Christ, is to grow to be more like Jesus. To be more like Jesus. So the question is, how are we doing? How is Westside Family Church doing in becoming more like Jesus? Well, you may remember in the month of August, we asked you uh, to take a survey for us uh, to give us feedback on where you're at in your spiritual journey and where you're at in your relationship with Westside Family Church. And so many of you gave us responses. And when I asked the question, where are you? Uh, I actually now know because thanks to you, you told me where you're at. And I wanna give you some sort of the highlight summaries of where we are at as a church. Now, the first thing I want to show you is this, and you have to understand this, that in the spiritual growth continuum, there are four, there are four stages, if you will. Uh, the first stage we'll call exploring Christ. These are people who are part of West Side who, who have said, hey, I'm here, I'm listening, and I'm exploring, but I want you to know I haven't yet crossed the line of faith. I have not been baptized into the body of Christ yet, but I'm considering it. Uh, the second category is someone who's we would say is growing in Christ. Uh, this is a, a, a person who says to us, listen, I've crossed the line of faith, I'm in, and as a matter of fact, I've never been more excited in all my life about growing to know Christ more and more, but I want you to listen very carefully, I'm not very far along. 
The third stage is called close to Christ. These are people who say, now I've been in the journey for a while and to be totally honest with you, I'm really beginning to sense an intimacy with God in my life. But then there's one more phase called Christ-centered. These are people at Westside who say, I am all in. The most important relationship in my life that drives everything about me is my relationship and intimacy with Jesus Christ. So of those four, where does Westside fall in to the thousands of churches across the country and the world that have taken it? Well, I'm gonna show you a little slide, and this is where we're at. Now, uh, these two colors here represent average. This represents below average, okay? So in, in the nation and around the world, uh, we have about 7% of our population here at Westside who say, I'm exploring Christ. You may be sitting next to that person right now, and you are so welcomed here. And it may take a long time, right? But you're welcome here. That's about average. Uh, over here, we have about 19% who are considered Christ-centered, that label themselves as Christ-centered. Christ is the most important part of their relationship. We're average, but listen to this. 20%, you know, one in five people in this congregation are all in for Jesus. That's pretty cool. Okay, maybe average, but it's still pretty good. Uh, now, here's one where we're a little below average in, 24% of people who are close to Christ. But the thing I wanna pull your, uh, draw your attention to is this blue, that is like way above average. The vast majority of people, I get it, the vast majority of people who make up Westside Family Church are people who said, I have crossed the line of faith and I am so excited about my journey, I'm so excited about learning, but I'm not that far along, so don't treat me like that. Okay, so we get it. I think that's pretty exciting to be in a church where there's so many new believers that are wanting to go, don't you? Now, we also, that's pretty cool, yeah, that's all, right? Now, um, we also learned about where you're struggling. And I just wanna highlight three things because you are asking for our help and we're intending on helping you, three things. The first one is, help us understand the Bible in greater depth. You are telling us as a body, we really, you know, want to understand the Bible. Did I hear that right? Yeah. We really want to understand God's word. We appreciate your human wisdom, but a little less of that, a little bit more God. I get that, right? And another thing you said is you want your pastors to, no kidding, straightforward, teach you what the Bible says uh, about your beliefs and about how you're supposed to live your life, even if it means stepping on your toes, right? You want that? All right, okay. Well, you got the right guy for that. You may regret it, but you got the right guy. Here's the second thing that's really interesting that it stands out for this congregation, something that you're struggling with that you want help in, is help us to see how God is actively involved in our lives. What you're saying is, I, I, I understand that God is involved in and cares about our daily life, but I need you to teach me a little bit more because right now I'm not seeing it. I'm not, I'm not seeing how God is involved in my life, and so we're gonna help you with that. But the last one I'm gonna show you here is the one that we scored really low in really low. I mean, over the national average, super duper low. And I have to tell you, it surprised me, but that's okay, because we can help you. Here's what it says. Help us to learn how to pray, to seek guidance for our life. I hear you saying, I believe in prayer, but man, you're going to have to teach me how to pray in such a way that when I'm done with my prayer, I have some sense of what God wants me to do. I think that's awesome that you've asked, and I can promise you in the days that come, we're gonna, we're gonna work with you on that. As a matter of fact, as we finish the first 10 beliefs, uh, we're going to move into the 10 key spiritual practices, and one of them is going to be prayer, and we're gonna begin to introduce you to this very important spiritual practice. Now, the last thing I wanna show you from the survey that you gave us feedback on, we get it, uh, that surprised me a little bit, but we gotta talk about it, and that's this. One in five of you are stalled spiritually meaning 20% of the congregation is saying, I'm in a season of my life where I'm stuck, where I'm just not growing. And I could really use some help from that. And now we, through our research, have identified three primary reasons why a person stalls out or gets stuck spiritually. Uh, one is because of external circumstances like divorce or cancer. It just kind of halts you in a way. And some of you are, are going through that. Uh, a second reason is because the church is not doing their part that they need to be doing to help you. Well, 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 we're gonna be getting after it. So that may be the issue. We own it, but we're gonna take it to a whole nother level if you'll journey with us. But the third and the most common reason a person stalls spiritually is because of busyness. 
People just practically are saying, I want more of God, but I don't have any more time to give. And so we're gonna have to tackle this issue of busyness in your life to get you at how to practice your spiritual life in a very profound way. Now, with all of that said, there are also many awesome signs that God is doing some awesome things through this church that looks a whole lot like Jesus. For example, this last week, I I got the privilege of going to an event uh, sponsored by KVC, which is a national organization based out of Kansas City that deals, it's not a spiritual organization, a faith-based organization, but they deal with helping to grow healthy families with families at risk, foster care and adoption, and several other issues related to mental illness amongst kids and all that. And they gave out their annual awards this year, and there were several, not many given out, but we were the only church that got an award. Uh, And I'm gonna show you a picture of that. There it is, right? There it is, huh? That's pretty cool. Given an award for the work that we do Amongst the least of these, particularly those in relationship to foster care and adoption, in the middle there is our leader, Jen Decker, who leads this. But I can promise you, whenever there's an award to be giving out, Randy Frazee will show up in the picture. (laughs) After this service today, this is one of the many signs. After the service today, uh, we're we're gonna do something really cool. Uh, A couple weeks ago, a guy comes up to me, kind of a big guy, uh, and uh, basically... He has just had a radical life change through a handful of other guys who are part of the body of Christ here who've come alongside of this guy who's had a messed up, messed up situation and he's done a 180 and he says to me, Randy, I want you to baptize me in two weeks in the pond. And I thought, man, that is cool. So after the service today, um, we're gonna head out to the pond and, uh, and this guy's gonna be baptized into Christ. Now, when I woke up this morning and I looked at my, my clock, and my, it said 33 degrees. And so I talked to our uh, insurance risk averse people and they said there's a highly likelihood that you're gonna have uh, like, um, like uh, hypothermia and your heart's gonna stop and that's not good for the church. So uh, I'm gonna go out and I'm going to be there, and then uh, Joe, back here, give it, give it up, Joe, is gonna actually get in the water and baptize his brother into Jesus. So we're super excited about that. Woo. Okay, I wanna wrap up by, by really making this super simple, the whole message super simple. Some of you know, uh, and some of you don't, that we have a son, uh, David, who was born without a hand below his elbow. He actually came to speak this summer. He's now 31 years old, and he's an attorney in uh, Washington, D.C., but when he was about five or six years old, uh, he was in Sunday school class at the church that I was pastoring in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and on this particular Sunday, the teacher was teaching on the church, and so she did this little common exercise you may be familiar with. She said, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door and see all the people, and then she turned to the class and said, now class, you try it. And uh, she then realized that she asked my son to do something that he cannot literally do on his own. But before she could fix the mess she created, David's best friend reached out to him and said, here, David, take my hand and we'll do it together. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door and see all the people. That illustration should never ever be done again by an individual because the church is not an individual. The church is a community of people who are working together to become more like Jesus for the sake of each other and for the sake of a hurting community and world we live in. This is our challenge I lay before you today. The key idea, say it with me if you know it, I believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to be standing to your feet. Uh, We've got um, our prayer partners that are here after the service to pray for you. If you'd like to receive Christ, like to be baptized, they're also going to be uh, in the prayer room. Also want to remind you, let you know that uh, next Sunday night after the five o'clock service, uh, I'll be heading with a bunch of other people to Abundant Life Church where Pastor Phil Hopper is the pastor. You may recall Phil came here to speak for us in the What If the Church. 
uh, Abundant Life, Colonial Press, and Westside Family Church are getting together at their church over in Kansas City, Missouri, um, and, uh, and they've got a big room, and we're going to have a blowout worship experience, reminding ourselves and shouting to Kansas City that the church is not hundreds of churches, but rather the church is just one under the headship of Jesus Christ. You're gonna to wanna to put that on your calendar next Sunday night at 6.30 at Abundant Life. We're going to have a blast. Now, go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all people. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Have a great day, church. Thank you for joining us for this message from Westside Family Church. We're on a journey of discovering how to think, act, and be more like Jesus. If you've been impacted by what God is doing through the Believe journey, we'd love to hear from you. Share your story at westsidefamily.church forward slash we believe. These stories are incredibly encouraging to both our staff and our church family. If you'd like to invest in what God is doing through Westside, you can give online at westsidefamily.church forward slash give. Thank you so much for watching.